Welcome to Carson Valley United Methodist Church. And as always, it is a great day to worship our Lord. It's uh, the first clear day in about a month. Yay! It's well, Okay, I say clear. There's still a bit of smoke in the air, but it's not bad. Uh, we, we can see the mountains today, so that's a, that's a real blessing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. Just a few announcements I always try to make. I'm Tony Hafner. I'm blessed to be the pastor here. I'm so glad that you're with us today, either in person or on, uh, on our YouTube channel. As we begin today, let's see couple of announcements I always try to make the yellow cards those are for attendance and it gives me a way especially if you are a guest today to, to get back in touch with you and let you know I'm glad that you are here those yellow cards can go into the offering basket at the, at the exits on your way out the white cards uh, on the back of the pew in front of you those are for sharing prayer requests or praises now since we don't have our greeting time like we used to when we bring those cards up here to the front the best time to do that, if you haven't already given me one and you'd like to, is uh, during the birthday bank time. So a little bit later on in the worship service, we'll have our birthday bank. And uh, if you have a, a prayer request or praise that you haven't given me yet, that would be a good time to bring it up to me. All right, let's see. Those are all the announcements I have. Let's begin our worship then with, I want to walk as a child of the light. It's page 206 in the big hymnal. The words will be on the screen. Let's stand as you feel comfortable while we sing. Okay, Christy's going to play it through once for us. Thank you, Father, for your love and your guidance. We are his children. He has chosen, and in his, and in his word, he reassures us of his constant presence. The living Christ is at your side at all times, and under all circumstances. He will guide you from the darkness into his light of hope and peace. Walk with our Lord and be filled with his love. Amen. All right, gather the kids around the screen. It's time for our children's time. Please be seated. And uh, with that, here's Miss Nancy. Good morning, Sydney. Good morning, Miss Nancy. 
boy, am I glad to be here today. Well, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that y'all let me come to church. Well, why wouldn't we? Well, I'm a pig. Oh, that's okay. We, we are accepting of all kinds of folks here. Not my kind. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, what do pigs like to do? Uh, they um, like to roll in the mud? Bingo. And what happens when you roll in the mud? You get dirty. <laughs> Bingo again. Now, now, what, what is the opposite of clean? Dirty. Okay, try again. Let's think about the opposite of clean would be unclean. Exactly, that's what I'm talking about. And the Bible says that you shouldn't hang out with anyone or anything that's unclean. Oh, oh, but Sydney, that's just your outsides. But it's still dirt. Well, yeah, but you're clean now. Yeah, but... But God, I took a bath, you know, but, but God still knows that I was covered in dirt. Well, yeah, but, but God made dirt and dirt don't hurt. Huh. Yeah, nice, nice poem, but um, it doesn't exactly help me know what the Bible says about being unclean. Oh, okay. Well, you know, you know about the Ten Commandments, right? Uh-huh. Well, really, the Old Testament is full of hundreds of rules for the people of the time, um, and a lot of them were there to keep them healthy. And so things that were unclean were, were usually things that were bad for them. Oh, so, like, nowadays, we, don't have, we, we can't be unclean? Oh, no, not exactly. You see, Jesus told his disciples that... Being unclean doesn't have to do with your outsides. It's what's in your heart. And, and unclean are, are like bad things like lying and cheating and, and hating. Oh, ick. I don't, want, I don't want to be unclean of my heart. Oh, I know we don't. Well, well, what do I do? How do I help? Oh, well, the best way is to keep your heart and your mind focused on Jesus. Oh. You know, we all mess up sometimes, and we need forgiveness. And Jesus is always there to forgive us and to help us to do better. So we can be clean. Oh, I, I'm really, really happy to be here now because now I know that, that what my outsides are isn't important. It's what's in my heart that needs to be clean. That's right. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for helping us to be good people. Help us to share your love from our clean hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye, Sydney. All right. It's time for our birthday bank. Birthday Bank is a great way to celebrate special events in our lives with a small offering that goes into uh, our birthday bank here, but it also uh, then goes to a separate fund in the church. That fund is used to support programs and, programs and projects around the world and in our community that help children. So uh, what celebrations do we have today? Hi, Bruce. Today, Linda has been married 51 years. Wow, 51 years of married bliss. All right. <laughs> Today, yes. Happy anniversary. Prayers for Linda. <laughs> Lynn lifts up uh, prayers for Linda. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, with that, uh, we come to our tithes and our offerings. And uh, especially those of you who are watching online on our YouTube channel, thank you so much for, for your faithful stewardship. All of us gathered here, thank you for your faithful stewardship. Uh, 
If you are watching on our YouTube channel, I just want to remind you, in case you don't already know, or if you, or, or if you don't already know, our uh, website, our church website, has a link on it that you can go to to, uh, to give online to our church. You need not actually be here in person to be able to do that. Uh, that said, um, it's time now for our, our offertory. All right, today, it's, uh, Skip is going to bless us. Well, yeah, yeah, you, yes, you are. You're going to bless us. Well, I enjoy doing this once in a while. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And uh, the song I'm going to do today eh, marginally has religious overtones. <laughs> but but uh, it, it's a song that was written and performed by Dan Seals. It's called God Must Be a Cowboy. Fire, some coffee from a tin cup in my hand sure warms the fingers when it's cold a playing this old guitar a friend I understand sure smooth the wrinkles in my soul a sleeping in the moonlight a blanket for my bed leaves a peaceful feeling in my mind waking up in the morning with an eagle overhead makes me long to fly away before my time and I think God must be a cowboy at heart he made wide open spaces from the stars He made grass and trees and mountains and a horse to be a friend and trails to lead old cowboys home again. Nightlife in big cities is all right for a while. Sure you feel good when you're there but the country is so pretty it goes on and on for miles takes away my troubles and my cares and I think God must be a cowboy at heart he made wide open spaces from the start. He made grass and trees and mountains and a horse to be a friend and trails to lead old cowboys home again. And I think God must be a cowboy at heart he made wide open spaces from the start he made grass and trees and mountains and a horse to be a friend 
and trails to lead old cowboys home again. And trails to lead old cowboys home again. Thank you, Skip. That was wonderful. <laughs> God does bless everyone. Thank you, O oh God, for many gifts that you give to your church. And we are thankful for all the people who support your son, Jesus Christ, who continues to follow your word, to reach out to the lonely and lost children in the world, that we will bring you glory. Amen. Okay, we come now to our prayers and praises. I have uh, several prayers and a couple of praises as well that have been given to me uh, via email and one card that was given to me also. What I'll do first is read the, uh, the prayers. After I've read those prayers, we'll lift our voices together saying, Lord, hear our prayers. After I've read the praises, we'll likewise join our voices together this time saying, we thank you, Lord. As we come into this uh, time of prayer, Christy, please help us quiet our hearts and minds. Martha lifts up uh, prayers for uh, evacuees of, uh, in, in the path of Hurricane Ida that is in Louisiana. Uh, prayers for them and for their homes and their property. Uh, also prayers for the Caldor Fire evacuees. We will be praying for a containment of that as well. This is from uh, Joan Sondrager. Uh, prayers for the family of Audrey Kleinhaus. She has passed away from COVID. Uh, prayers for her family and friends. Uh, this is received on, from our website uh, from James Arthur White. Uh, need prayer, lost my mom last Wednesday, August 11th. Um, now wondering what the Lord wants me to do. Uh, Pray for healing for me and for siblings, and just to know and have peace that our mom is with the Lord now. So be in prayer for, be in prayer for uh, James Arthur White and his entire family at the loss of his mother. Uh, I've got a prayer here that uh, is for the family and friends of Hans Salani. Now Hans passed away August first. So be in prayer for, for Patty and for the rest of family and friends. Uh, from Sharon Holsher Day, uh, prayers for my grandniece Emma, who got COVID from another, another girl at Girl Scout camp and gave it to her dad. Prayers that her sister and her grandmother uh, don't get it. Uh, these are our prayers. Let's lift them up to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Uh, we have a couple of praises here. Yeah, okay. This is from uh, Deborah Blackman. Uh, praise God for healing. Exactly three months from surgery, I got the okay to ditch the brace from my broken leg. Uh, many thanks to everyone who sent prayers and cards and good wishes. All right. And uh, another praise for uh, T.J. Golubic. Uh, Yay. He has uh, done a fantastic job as our AV tech. Thanks, thanks so much, T.J. And best wishes as he moves on. Going to college, yay. 
And uh, uh, ultimate goal would be a pharmacist. Is that correct? All right, good. These are our praises. Let's lift them up to the Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amen. I'll pause for a moment of silent prayer. And as always in the silence, I encourage each of us to open our hearts to God and lift up unspoken prayer concerns or praises. <coughs> Loving God, we come to you in, in sure and certain uh, hope that you indeed hear our prayers in these troubled times of, of COVID and, and wildfires. We, we cry out to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. All right. Well, today we are going to sing uh, the Lord's Prayer for the last time this month. I invite you to uh, stand as you feel comfortable. We, we become one when we stand. I invite you to become one with me as we sing the Lord's Prayer today. Please be seated once again. Um, Lynn and Christy are going to bless us this morning with our anthem. Chris and I did this uh, maybe two months ago, and it's an audience, audience participation. Uh, you'll come in on the chorus of Awesome God, so feel free to do so. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is the King of Kings. And he shall lift you up. And he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.
Today's word is from Mark 7, verse 14 to 23. Please stand for the gospel reading. Then he called the crowd again, and he said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters the heart, not the heart, but the stomach, and goes into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these things, evil things, come from within and they defile a person. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated once again. Ah, Today's sermon is about being clean. Being clean. This this passage from Mark, it's also found in the same uh, circumstances are found in Matthew's gospel as well. There is a controversy that erupts about uh, Jesus and his disciples eating without washing their hands first. uh, There was a ceremonial sort of washing of the hands that... uh, that was a part of the tradition of the elders is what it was called, but it was something that goes way back to the, uh, uh, the law of Moses and, and the interpretation thereof and uh, some of the other uh, traditions that developed around that law of Moses and, and keeping people ceremonially clean. Uh, Jesus and his disciples had, had been eating without washed hands. Jesus then uh, is confronted by the Pharisees, these people who are really particular about, about keeping the law of Moses. And, and uh, Jesus, Jesus says to them that their, their laws that they are teaching are the traditions of humans and that, uh, that the law of God is, is something more profound, more, more important than that. He goes on to uh, uh, tell the crowds about him that, that are gathered about uh, that that nothing from the outside can defile a person. It's what's from the inside that makes a person clean or unclean. What is, uh, what is this, this clean cleanliness that we're talking about? Well, it's sort of like Sidney learned. It's not about something on the outside, but it's about being pure. It's about being right with God. It's about, well, it's, it's, it's this, this sort of religious sort of cleanliness, I guess you would say. And every, you know, uh, many religions, most religions have this idea of religious purity about being right with God or being not right with God, being clean or being unclean. And uh, that, that religious sort of purity can, can become so intense and the desire to remain so pure, uh, to remain so, and, and the the fear of becoming unclean or the, I guess, the, the, the hatred of the unclean can be so, come so intense that, that very religious people would do things that they would not normally do. Um, this is a, a picture I found online of a man who was, uh, who was killed uh, because, well, because he was unclean. And so this idea of unclean, that 
and, and the idea that there can be some people who are unclean, uh, that begins to infect our ideas about our fellow human beings so that, that some of them become subhuman. Now, I, granted, this is a case where where that idea of some people being subhuman is kind of built into the religion. Uh, well, you remember, uh, you, you, I hope you do remember, that uh, Gan Pantha is uh, coming to, to speak to us on the first Sunday of November. He is the leader of, uh, of uh, a ministry called the Children Rescue Mission where, he, where they, 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 tend, they try to rescue children, uh, the, the most impoverished children in Nepal, largely a Hindu nation. Uh, these children are families of what are called the Dalit. Dalit. Uh, and the Dalit are the lowest caste in Hindu society, and that they are called the untouchables. Dalit. Now, the Dalit are untouchable because to touch them would to make someone who is of, of a higher caste become impure, become unclean. Um, the, the man photographed here was was killed because he had defiled people of the higher caste by eating in front of them. This now, this now, this now, is there anybody, okay, is there anybody because of who they are, because of what they are, that would make us unclean, that if they were to walk in this place right now, would make us unclean or would defile this holy place? Keep that in mind. I'll, I'll come back to that one. All right. For the Jews, though, it was it was a, a very powerful thing. This idea of cleanliness or uncleanliness uh, according to the law of Moses. This is a, a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter four, verse six. Uh, as Moses is departing from the people, this Deuteronomy is kind of Moses' pretty long farewell address to the people. Uh, he says, "Keep therefore and do these laws, these requirements." For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. You see, the, the requirements of the law of Moses are, are not supposed to be some, something uh, you know, that is just craziness. No, this is supposed to be wisdom. And the, in the eyes of the nations, they see this, this community of people, this nation of people, of following these laws that were given to them by their God. This is supposed to demonstrate to the nations around them uh, their wisdom and their relationship with God. And so certainly by the first century, by the time that Jesus is there, uh, the following of these, these laws and the idea of cleanliness and uncleanliness was a matter of... of relationship with God, but also a matter of patriotism. So it was about God and nation, not just, not just uh, some sort of ritual, uh, religious sort of thing. No, this was, about, this was about do you support who we are as a nation, as a people, uh, in relationship with, with our God. This is what defines us. As it, I, can't, I can't express to you how deep this ran for the people uh, in Jerusalem in the day of Jesus. It was, it was one of the most important things, especially for the Pharisees. How does it work? Here's, here's how it works. Okay, it's not about germs, okay? Uh, how, how does something become unclean, ritually unclean? Uh, how could you defile yourself by eating before you, without washing your hands? Does anybody, this is George uh, Costanza in, uh, in the Seinfeld episode, this guy on, on the screen here. And uh, here's how it works. Okay, George is in the library. And in this particular episode, he picks up a book. And if you can see the title, it's, the big, it's one of those big coffee table picture books. And it's a book on Impressionism, right? George Costanza has no desire to buy a book on Impressionism. But he's got to go to the bathroom, right? So he picks up a book. He carries it into the bathroom with him to, to read you know, while he's there in the bathroom. And when he comes out, he tries to put it back on the shelf. Okay? And here's what happens. All right? He is confronted by the, by the, uh, the bookstore owner. This book has been in the bathroom. All right. So George Costanza has, is forced to buy this book, which he doesn't really want. He just took it to look at the pictures while he was in the bathroom. But you see, the book is thereby declared to be impure. 
uh, it's, it's unclean. It cannot be sold. George has to buy the book. He takes it home. He tries to bring it back to the bookstore several times. And every time he brings it back they, the, to get a refund, uh, the, the clerk scans it and says, Oh, we can't take this. This book has been flagged. It's unclean. It, it's been in the bathroom. You see, it's not, it's not so much about, about actual germs. Uh, something becomes unclean because it's been in the proximity of something that is deemed to be defiling. Something that, some unclean place, some, some psychologically or, or religiously unclean place, something then is contaminated and becomes unclean. Then that thing that's unclean can enter into the presence of other clean things and make them unclean. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, a chain reaction sort of a thing. All right. What about us? Is there anything that can be defiled? And I'm going to say that, that in the United Methodist Church, we, we're, we're pretty open. We try to, to be open and we try to, to not have those boundaries of cleanliness and uncleanliness, but there are some things. Uh, it, think of the, of the elements in communion. When we have communion, we have uh, unfermented wine, commonly called grape juice, and we have bread. And there's a moment in that uh, communion liturgy where I ask God's spirit to make them be something for us besides simply grape juice and bread. I ask God's spirit to make them spiritually be for us God's, uh, the, the body and blood of Christ. Now, what do we do after the worship service? Uh, our, 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 our theology, our polity, dare I say our doctrine, tells me that, that, that I don't just pour the, the juice down the drain and I don't just dump the, the unused bread in the trash because that would defile those things spiritually. They have been consecrated. They have become for us spiritually the body and blood of Christ. What do we do with those things? Uh, I am to either make sure they are consumed, that is to say drank the, the juice drank and the bread eaten, or I return them to the earth. So what I can do is I go outside. Very often you'll see me go outside and, and pour out. If we're doing intinction, back when we used to do intinction, I would, I would pour out the unused grape juice onto the ground. The bread, I either take home and eat, or I go to the park and feed it to the ducks or the geese, or I, I spread it on the ground out here uh, for the animals to eat. Uh, I will tell you that if you go to the Lampy Park to feed the geese your bread. Do not think you're going to get out of your car with a big chunk of bread and just kind of leisurely stand there and go like this and feed the ducks. No, you sit in your car, you break it all into little pieces before you ever get out of your car. And when you get out there, as soon as they see you coming with bread, you've got to take that, that, that batch of bread chunks you've got and just fling it out there and run, okay? <laughs> Geese can be pretty aggressive. Wow, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I've learned my lesson. But what, yeah, what can be defiled? You know, that's, the, that's an appropriate uh, way to dispose of something that we believe to be sacred. So, yes, you know, in the United Methodist Church, we, we have those, those things that, that can be defiled, I guess you'd say. What about us? Now, I want to come back to that question, all right? Could anybody walk in here? that would defile us? Is there anybody here that is, that is unclean? Uh, is, there anybody, is there anybody that could come in here that would be unclean to, to the point that we would, we would say, gosh, I, you know, now we've got to do something. Now we've got to you know, smudge the entire sanctuary or something you know, to, 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 to relieve the, the uncleanliness. You know, what, what could there, is there anybody that we could do that? No. I, hopefully we all say no. There's nobody that could come in here that would make us unclean. But what about other settings, okay? What about your civic club, okay? The Kiwanis, the Rotary Club. Is there somebody that could walk in there that would, that would be so unwelcome that it would be seen to be an, an, an act of defilement? What about our political clubs, okay? What about our, our political gatherings, our political meetings? 
Could someone come into those settings and defile that setting because of who they are or what they are, what affiliations that they have? Oh, I dare say that that is possible. Whereas in this setting, we say grace is here, right? In those settings, we say, I don't want to sit next to that person. You see, the power of defilement, the power of clean versus unclean, is very much culturally uh, uh, based. That the power of uncleanness, the power of defilement, comes from culture much more than it does religion. And our, our, our response, that reaction, comes much more from culture, the setting where we find ourselves, than it does from, from true religious conviction. Could anyone defile us? I hope not. The words of Jesus for us, I think, are, are both comforting and challenging. They comfort us because they, they tell us that there's nothing on the outside that can make us unclean. They comfort us because, because they let us know that, that there's nothing, there's nothing that, that could come into this place that would make us unclean. There's nothing that, that we can, can encounter on the outside that from... That, that on the outside of the sanctuary, that, that from, from the outside could make us uh, unclean in God's eyes. But, but they also challenge us. They challenge us because, because they inform us that it goes far beyond that. It's much deeper than that. It's as deep as the very soul within us. It's as deep as our hearts within us. He says to us, it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Wow. So it is both comforting and it is challenging at the same time. I'll say that, that the value of these religious laws uh, for for the Jewish people is 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 so it's so important. Okay, you know a lot of times we look at these these uh, uh, laws of the Old Testament. We look at the Book of Leviticus and we, we we consider the tradition of the elders that Jesus was was uh, confronted by the Pharisees about, and we say, oh, you know, gee, what a bunch of religious hocus pocus. You know, why did God, you know? God just gave us gave them those rules to make sure that they would do it. You know, God God gave them all those rules to make sure they would obey God. You know, in some sense, and that's that's kind of the way that we characterize this. But I suggest to you that no. The value of these laws these 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 laws in the Old Testament, and even for contemporary Jews, is so so important for maintaining that relationship with God, because you see it. It keeps people in a, in a in a, a continual recognition of their need for repentance and a continual re returning to God in repentance. Repentance simply means turning around, turning around and turning toward God. And so the, the laws that, that God gives God's people are are an important part of them never forgetting their need to turn around turn away from culture, turn away from their, from their selfishness, turn away from their anger, their prejudice, their pride, all those things, and turn toward God. And that is also true for us. Jesus tells us of a much deeper need for repentance, doesn't he? It's from within the human heart that evil intention come, intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, which means greed, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, which means a rebellious attitude. Licentiousness means to rebel against accepted norms, to, re, to rebel against, against rules and regulations. There is, of course, a, a, a sexual sort of a tone to that, but the, the broader meaning of the word licentious is to simply be be rebelling against any sort of containment. You know, that, that you've got a, 
you've got to do whatever you're going to want to do regardless of what is right or acceptable or even legal. Envy. Slander. What now? It's starting to get, it's getting kind of warm in here now, isn't it? Uh, pride. Folly. He says all these evils. He calls all those things evil. He says they come from within. So Jesus points out the need for this deeper need for cleansing of not the outside, but a cleansing of the heart. Jesus points out this need for repentance. I'm going to read from the book of Hebrews. Referring to the Old Testament sacrifices that people made as they returned to God. The author of Hebrews says this, For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our hearts from dead works to worship the living God? Jesus tells us a deeper meaning of what it means to be unclean. We should recognize ourselves there. And we should turn toward God. Now, the great thing about, about turning toward God, about repentance, is that it involves two things. It involves turning, and then it involves movement. If I repent and I simply turn, okay, and I don't do anything else, then I have, have I really done much at all? The act of repentance means not only turning away from the things that we have done, but then turning toward God. Then just as we have moved toward those evil things, now we move toward God. What are some of the things that it has? Okay, well, okay, uh, murder. Okay, well, I'm going to quit murdering. No, that's not really something I can do. Okay, uh, St uh, theft, okay, well, I'm going to quit stealing. Well, that's, I, I, I don't have that problem. You know, it's like, okay. Uh, oh, wait a minute, here's some. Deceit. Hmm, deceit. I'm going to have to remember that when it comes time to do my taxes again. Okay. Uh, uh, envy. Uh, how, do we, how do we turn away from envy? What might we do? What might that look like? Uh, licentiousness, th this rebellion that we have against the, the, you know, laws and regulations, dare I say mandates that are imposed upon us, you know? Uh, slander, I quit slandering. Maybe I should compliment people. Maybe I should talk well about people. Pride. You know, pride, I think, is the foundation for all of these things. What does it look like if we simply, if we turn around, we turn toward God and we move toward God and away from those things that we have repented of, that Christ died for, that Christ cleanses us of? I think we become better people, don't we? It's one thing to repent and remain just the same, but it's another thing to turn toward God and become better people. And I believe that that is what Jesus empowers us to do. Yeah. Something is here for us. Um, you know, there's something here for us as a church. Um, you know, we have a strong sense of, of being saved. We have, a, we have a strong confidence in, in the love of God for us. You know, as, as Methodists, we have a strong sense of grace. We believe that in, first and foremost in grace. That's a, a profound aspect of our theology. And so, and so we, we have this, this openness and we say that, that, that things, things don't bother us, you know, so much. You know, that, that the unclean things around us don't get to us that much. That we have a confidence even, even among those things. But I'm going to say that, that there are some, there, typically there is something. There's some things. And I'm going to say that, that those things as a church that, that we that we're afraid to, to, to let in, that we're afraid to, to uh, that we're afraid that might contaminate us, you know? Those things, if you can think of those things, those things point to a certain insecurity. Those things point to a certain fragile, 
fragile aspect of our salvation. You, you look at churches, there are churches that, that have an extremely fragile sense of salvation. And they mask that by putting up strong boundaries and barriers all around them. And they say, yeah, so strong is our salvation that we're going to keep ourselves away from anybody around us that's not like us. Martha and I, Martha and I were at church once where uh, every, we were all encouraged not to associate, not to associate with anybody outside of the congregation. It's like all, all, the, all the eyes in the, turn, in the room turn and look towards you, you know. It's like, like I said, we were there once. Um, what about, so there's something there as a church that there are, there is this, this power of God. And, and this power of God has declared that we can't be contaminated from the outside. But what about from the inside? There's something here for us as individuals too, isn't there? Look at that list. There's one on that list. There's one on that list that, that I, I scratched my head about initially, okay? The last one he said, okay? Let's look at this. I'm just going to pick up about halfway through. Licentiousness, vice, I should have picked a different place to start. Licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. Folly? Really? Don't we think of folly as being something innocent? Folly is just mistakes that we made. You know, folly is, is foolishness. Folly is, is what, how would that be something that is evil? Folly. Um, until I realized that the kind of folly that Jesus is, is speaking of here is a, is a folly that is the opposite of wisdom. Okay? Folly is the opposite of wisdom. Wisdom is intentionally pursued. Wisdom is begged for. Wisdom is asked for. Wisdom is humbly pursued. I want to suggest to you that folly is pridefully pursued. And as the opposite of wisdom, it is ignorance. So, so folly, in Jesus' terms here, is a a prideful, willful ignorance. Man, I'll tell you what, when I look at it like that, all of a sudden I'm going, holy cow. This is an affliction that affects the hearts of, of every person in the world. So, Great is there something here for us that we need Jesus. You know, a lot of times I, I preach and I end up patting ourselves on the back and I show a picture of the church and I say what a great church we are and tell what we're going to be doing. I'm going to say, man, today, today I need to just come before Jesus. And so it is that, that we're just going to pray now and uh, uh, seek God's enlightenment, seek God's blessing that we might return uh, toward God. Father in heaven, we, we call upon you now. Show us where, show us where we have become unclean, those spots, those blemishes, those smudges that, that you see that we hide from ourselves. Show us, almighty God. Speak into our, our minds in this moment. Father, we come humbly before you. Trusting in nothing but the blood of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Sprinkle, of, sprinkle us afresh, almighty God. By that same spirit that showed us now show us that we are yours. Help us to leave this place a little bit more humble and a lot more clean. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right.
Our closing hymn today is number 419. It is a powerful thing to, uh, to say these words, I am thine, O Lord. And it is ours to say through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Empowered by the Spirit, we sing. I invite you to stand as you feel comfortable while we sing, I am thine, O Lord. As we venture forth today, there are just a few, oh, there's a bunch of friendly reminders. Okay. Flowers Day are in celebration of Bruce and Linda Kozak's 51st anniversary. Aww. Yay, happy anniversary. <laughs> Our prayer trees are back. They're, you may recognize them. They're painted on that, that window right back in the back of the sanctuary. Those uh, contain right now a clothesline full of little prayer uh, uh, prayer targets, I guess. I'm not sure what we call them. Uh, it, pick a, pick a prayer, requests. prayer requests. I'm not sure they've been requested, but they're, they're people that we have, have identified or communities or organizations that we've identified that we'd like to, we'd like to pray for. So pull, a, pull an item off the clothesline there and then pray for that this coming week. You don't have to, you don't have to keep praying for it forever and ever. Just uh, for one week, pray for the item that you uh, have selected off the, uh, uh, the prayer tree. And then next week, pull another one off and pray for that one for a week. All right. Project School Days. Thank you to all the volunteers. They were here and uh, backs, bagged and boxed up all the, all the school supplies for the teachers that had been requested. So thank you, everybody that volunteered for that. Our Bible study started last Monday, and it continues tomorrow. Uh, come and learn more about Psalms. Like this, this week, we're looking at... <clears throat> Excuse me. No, this week we're, we're looking at Psalm 23. Is that right? All right, Psalm 23. It's a favorite, so please be here for that. 6:30 p.m. And then, uh, yeah, we had 15 people there. It was awesome. Uh, join us Tuesdays at 8:30 a.m. for worship at Carson Valley Senior Living. Uh, come, we, we sing for 30 minutes and we read a devotional from the upper room. It's a lot of fun. We sing a lot of the old, the old favorite hymns too. And our holiday uh, craft team is uh, uh, crafting. We are meet, they're meeting tomorrow, right? 9.30, 8, not tomorrow? Every, 
Oh, starting on the 13th, they're meeting every Monday. Okay. All right, Chili Cook-Off coming September 19th. Yay. There, is, there should be sign-up sheets somewhere, I think. On the fellowship hall on the bulletin board. Okay. And our golf tournament. There is a sign-up sheet in the lobby on the easel right as you come in the, the doorway there. Uh, be sure and sign up if you want to play golf. And our disaster relief fund. This is the last Sunday that we'll be collecting for uh, Dixie Fire and that, you know, churches affected in that area. Uh, our, our local disaster relief has been uh, the Tamrac and I guess the, now the Caldor Fire. Uh, that fund is growing as well, but uh, today's, uh, today's disaster relief uh, fund offering is the last one that will be targeted for the Dixie Fire. All right, let's receive our benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever as we go in peace. Amen. This choir starts this coming Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It'll be here at the church? Mm -hmm. 5.30 okay. for potluck, 6.30 for rehearsal. 5.30 for potluck and 6.30 for beginning of the rehearsal? Isn't that great? The chancel choir starts back this coming Wednesday. <laughs> Practice, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm.